Hi everyone, welcome back to Rick's 135th Scale Models. My name is Rick. As you can see today, I'm outside, and that's because I just finished my Amusing Hobby KF51, and I thought that it would be better to show it in the light, um, because a lot of the pictures you'll see of the actual vehicle, they're in the full sunlight, and to show the accuracy of the uh, process. Now, in part one of the video, I did the open box review, and that's pretty straightforward. Part two, I did the build and the priming. Now, in uh, reviewing that, what I did was I went to the build. Now, as I said in that video, the build went fine. The model itself goes together good. All the parts fit nicely. The instructions were pretty straightforward. There were a few parts left in the box, and, and I, at that time, I didn't realize what they were, but in doing some research, those parts belong to the smoke launchers. If you didn't put the resin in, I think that they changed it after they created the sprue sheets. Um, but uh, those parts weren't needed. Other than that, you had some extra road wheels because of the way the sprues were set up, uh, but nothing at all a problem. Now, my criticisms of the kit were number one, the, the plastic itself is really soft. Now, it came together great assembly-wise, but when you touch glue to it, it immediately started softening the plastic and melting it. So if you put glue in the wrong spot and tried to wipe it off within a second, it smeared and created a problem. That was a little bit of a challenge, so I had to make sure that I did it glue right and then make sure that it cured properly, or I was gonna have problems later on. Second of all, um, they had some of the, uh, doors on it that have uh, handles. Some of them they had extra handles that you put on after the fact, which was a great look. And then the other ones they had done the old style plastic just sticks up a piece of uh, sprue there, um, which looked bad because it was a solid piece without the finger portion to go in where your fingers would go in. So what I did on those is I cut those off, I created a uh, resin one with my 3D printer, and I reinstalled those. Uh, the other thing I did is I noticed that on the barrel there's these grills that when you look at it it almost looks like it's a, like a reverse style L but actually it's vents. So I cut those out, put uh, um, mesh inside and the mesh I used was from a Tamiya 135th scale leopard model that I didn't use their mesh. So I put that in there it ended up looking great. Um, the other thing that I noticed was it didn't have the Rhine metal logo or the KF51 logo on the back. Now these are engraved metal parts that actually stick out from the vehicle. They're not like a decal. So what I did on those is I used my 3D printer. I created those logos and then installed them on. Now there's a couple ways you can go about that, the installation part. The best way would be before you build it to notch out the areas they go and then stick them in and then backfill it with some putty or something on the front. The back ones are on a grill so that's a little more challenging. But I did it after the fact so it created a little more of a challenge. So if you're going to do that, just plan on doing it before you build the model because it, it'll be a lot easier that way. Um, the other criticism I had was on the tracks. Now. The tracks, the way they had them attached to the sprue, it was fine, but they were very delicate. So you ended up breaking quite a few in the process of even just removing them because they're so fragile. And there weren't a lot of extras, um, even though it looked like there was. Um, I did a count after the fact and then had some other people kind of chime in on that. And, and I agree with them 100%. It was, there weren't very many extras. So the more you broke, the less chance you had of completing the model properly. Um, so what I end up doing is, is I used a uh, aftermarket Bronco product uh, of Leopard 2 tracks. They came out great. Um, you could have also used some um, uh, the uh, RFM aftermarket tracks or the metal tracks. Anything else um, would work great. They're pretty. The road wheels and uh, drive sprocket are to scale and properly uh, groove, so it, it would fit as long as the tracks themselves were correct. Um, after all that was done, I then primed the whole thing and got to this point. Now, let's uh, briefly talk about a little bit, then I'll go through the actual process. Um, basically, masking is straightforward. Um, there's two ways to mask. You can either mask in the forward way, which means you mask off the area you wanna paint, then you paint it and pull the mask off, or the reverse way, which is I, the way I did it, I paint the color that I'm masking on it, then I cover that 
and then I paint the next color and then I cover that and I paint the last color and then I remove all the tape. The problem with that is, is if you paint it with a lot of heavy paint, you will end up with lines and grooves and issues. So that creates a whole issue. So you have to be real cautious of that. Um, I'll kind of show you that process. The other issue that I noticed was the recommended paints they talk about are, I felt wrong. When you looked at them in real light, it just didn't match right. Um, so what they recommend you to use was the uh, Ming, or I'm sorry, MIG uh, light green, and then the MIG faded cyanide gray. Now, the green was way off. I, I just, I felt that it was wrong because it's got more of a, a lime color in it. So what I ended up doing was I used Tamiya's flat green and flat yellow and I'll talk about the mixture rate I did for those um, to make them match. And then when I took the uh, cyanide gray, I added a little bit of AV's um, light gray in there. And then I'll talk about that mixture also at, in the painting process. Um, those I think came out a lot more accurate. And as you can see, I think that it, it, it depicted the colors properly. The last thing I did is I took and created the decals. Now there are a couple decals on it. The uh, Hero 120 drone has a uh, logo on the side of it, which I found and recreated. And then on the side of the gun on the roof, Rhine Metal has a logo there. So I created that and I'll talk about that. But let's get into the actual masking and painting process now. Now prior to doing any of the masking, I had to prime it in black. And what I use is Mr. Hobby's Mr. Finishing Surfacer. I uh, let that cure for a couple days. And then from there, I used uh, Mr. Color's Terschwartz, which is a NATO black German version of Mr. Color. And I painted the vehicle in that black because I thought well, that would be the most accurate. Then I started the process of masking. Uh, now one of the things I did notice is uh, a lot of the stripes on this model are between two to four millimeters wide um, so I, some of them I made them uh, measured and cut as you can see here and others I used the uh, Tamiya masking tape which was uh, four meters wide and masked all the black areas off. Uh, basically what I'm doing here is a reverse style of masking where I've painted the color I want on and then I've covered it and then from there, I'm going to paint the next color over, and then I'm going to mask that part and then paint the final color. And you can see kind of the process here, how I'm going about that. So one of the other things I noticed as I was going through the diagram that is provided by Amusing Hobby is the colors aren't correct. So I took actual photos and referenced those to find uh, a more accurate depiction of how things looked and then went through the process of either doing it that way or correcting the masking I'd done so far. Uh, not a lot of errors, but pretty much on every side there's something they missed or did wrong. Once all the black was masked, I went through the process of creating the green. Now the green to me has kind of a lime color in it and uh, the recommended product they wanted you to use, I didn't like, I didn't feel it was correct, uh, which you can see here, it just didn't work right. Um, so what I did is I decided to create my own green and that was using uh, the acrylic from Tamiya flat yellow and flat green and I uh, figured out the right mix and then uh, went back and painted. But you can see here, this is the green that's recommended by the manufacturer and it's way off. 
So after testing the colors, the bright mix seemed to be 75% yellow and 25% green. That gave the right lime kind of a color in the true lighting. Uh, it really did seem to pop and blend just right. The other thing I did is I kind of tested the air pressures and uh, 26 PSI seemed to be right about right for my airbrush and where I'm, when, where I'm painting and when I was painting. Uh, it may be different for you, but that's kind of a trial and error experiment process. The other thing I did is as I painted, I pretty much painted the entire vehicle, making sure I got all the areas I know that was going to have the green on it, and then uh, let it cure for several hours and prepared it to be masked up next. Um, but you can see here, kind of the process of just making sure I have good solid covering. Uh, I'm not trying to do any kind of a two-tone look here. I just want it to really match and look uh, really sharp because this is a showpiece vehicle. I'm copying not just some uh, combat vehicle that's been out in the field and uh, faded and things like that. After I let the green dry uh, for a good period of time, for this I let it dry for about four hours, uh, I started the masking of the yellow. Uh, once again, making sure that the uh, pattern was correct because um, uh, the diagram isn't 100% accurate, uh, but going through tediously uh, this process. It does give great results. It is very time consuming, uh, but uh, like I said, uh, I was real happy with the results in the overall process. Now initially I only masked the turret because I wanted to get it painted with the gray and see what the results were. Um, so I had done this at this point and I started the paint process. Now with the gray I was a very cautious. I did slow coats because with uh, the AV and the, the MIG paints um, they want to run real easy. Uh, so I, I did light coats. Um, this actually took two coats um, before I was completed with it. Uh, but I did the normal four directions, hitting it from all sides to make sure I got in all the crevices and angles, and then uh, let it cure for a short period of time where it wasn't totally dry, but it wasn't uh, wet, and then quickly got the tape off so that I wouldn't get any of the ridges you'll get a lot of times from doing the masking. So whenever doing masking, this is the moment of truth and that kind of that breathless moment as you're pulling all the tape off, seeing what the results really looked. And as I pulled more and more tape off, uh, I was really, really pleased with the results and how it came out. Uh, it really started to come alive and uh, fit what I was desiring to accomplish. So I completed getting the turret all cleaned up and then uh, moved over to doing the lower hall and getting that done. And like I said, one of the things to make sure is that you're, uh, if you're just masking on your own design, that's one thing, but if you're trying to copy something, uh, make sure you look at lots of reference photos from different angles. One of the things I noticed with this is that uh, Rhine Metal has actually three different distinct patterns of this vehicle. So you had to make sure that you're using the same pattern or you'd mess yourself up in the process. The other thing is, is make sure your masking is down in all the edges and uh, has good coverage or you'll end up with paint seeping underneath.
So once the uh, tape was all done, I started the paint process. One of the things I did when I did the lower hull is I took a bottle and I pre-mixed the paint so I had a lot more volume and uh, that worked out much better at painting. And then I just started the paint process. Now I've got the uh, driver's hatch here I'm painting. I took a piece of tape and uh, stuck it down so it wouldn't blow off as I painted because there was really nothing to hold. And then I started the process of painting the lower hull. Uh, like I said, as usual, hitting it from multiple angles, getting a couple coats. So here I'm using a jig I purchased from Modelbaum Koenig out of Germany. It's a great little tool. Um, I, I can't remember who the manufacturer is, but if you go to their website and search around for Leopard 2 uh, parts, you'll find this jig. They have it for other models. I find it very useful for uh, painting because what it does is you paint the black road wheel and then you put it in the jig and then you can paint your main color on the painted area and your road wheel stays nice and uh, black on the tread part and you'll get a little bit of overspray around the perimeter which is normal so it makes it look really nice with a lot less of the headache of trying to mask it and do it by hand. Very useful tool if you're going to make multiples of the same kit uh, definitely something to acquire. Now once all the masking type painting was done, it was time to do the touch-up paint, which you always have to do. Now the key part here is you use the same paint that you're painting with the airbrush, but you have to thin it down. What I found most successful is I put a little bit of the thinner on the side in a separate little bowl, and then I lightly uh, get my brush wet, and I put a little bit of paint on it, and then I'll come along and do my touching up. Uh, the paint doesn't cover as good, but you're not looking for total coverage. You're just looking for touch-ups without creating that big bulky paint um, area if you're using straight paint out of the bottle. A uh, much more efficient way to touch up your edges. The other part is just using a really good clean fine brush to go about this process. Now on the back of the vehicle there's a black area. What I did is I taped it off then I used uh, liquid masking to cover up part of it and then uh, took straight flat black and sprayed it in this area and then uh, removed all that. Uh, much better results than hand painting. So then it was time to paint the tracks. Now I had already primed the tracks in a uh, brown. Uh, so what I did then is I taped them down, covering up the areas that were not uh, touched by the road wheel traction, and then used a mixture of smoke and silver to create the shiny area that the road wheel would be polishing on the track. And then I sprayed it from both directions to make sure I got it in. Now this isn't a 100% thick paint, it's just kind of a light over painting to create the highlights, but uh, it does give a great effect. From there, I flipped the track over and started uh, touching the pad area, which is uh, rubber. Now I'm using flat black here, and I just take a Q-tip and lightly get it a little bit of paint on it, and then dab the tracks. I like this effect. Uh, it's quick, it's efficient, but it also gives an uneven look, which the tracks do have because of the debris and damage they get, and then just the dust and grime that'll build up on them. Uh, I find this to be a much more efficient way of doing it. Once that was all done, it was time to install the tracks. Um, I left the road wheels off and the drive sprocket off, so this was a pretty simple process of just snaking it through the process area and then uh, connecting the two sections.
Now also, uh, prior to gluing it, I did put a couple of road wheels on, just set them in place, and then that'll help support the uh, two pieces of track. I put the uh, guide part down, put the two pins in, and then glued the top piece that has the actual rubber track pad part on. And uh, this worked pretty good. It takes a couple moments, but um, with the patience, it's an efficient way to do it. Let it dry, and then you can put all the rest of the road wheels and the dry sprocket in, and uh, it gets great results. Next stage was getting some of the decorative paint done on. There's a lot of little hand-painted parts, not to include all the turn signals and things like that. Um, I started that process kind of mixing the paint to get to the right uh, consistency I wanted, and then taking the fine brush and uh, touching up. Now on the sides of this, it has these little small black uh, areas. Um, they're almost impossible to paint, but what I did do is I got the paint semi-wet, um, and then when I kind of touched the brush in there, it naturally filled it like you do in a wash, and that made it a lot easier to paint it versus trying to get it all in there and not mess up the body of the model itself. Now when it came time to paint the optics, initially I painted the part that's on the outside um, in the main color by hand. And then I flipped it over and started painting all the lenses so that on the outside you'd see the shiny area, but on the inside you'd see the lens. Now what I did do is I put a small dab of silver in the center of it, and then I used the smoke on some of them, and others I used kind of a green combination of smoke, uh, depending on the lens and how it looked. And this when it all mixes together, your eye picks up the color that it looks like in uh, the real world. It looks a uh, really neat effect. That's kind of what I'm doing here. Now this is one of those processes to take your time at and uh, kind of play around with it. Uh, definitely uh, works out good. Here you can see I'm using the green to create the little green highlight that the lens has um, on the top ones. And then the main one I've, I hit it with smoke and then I'm going to hit it with one more coat of smoke to give it that uh, kind of a frosty smoky look that it has in the, the real life. Now on all the periscopes, when you look at a periscope, mind you, it's a thick piece of glass or uh, plexiglass or other type of material. And they have kind of a greenish silver hint to them. So what I've done is I've taken some green paint and silver paint, mixed them to kind of the blend I like, and then I paint the backside of the reflective area uh, prior to actually painting it with the main color it would be so that when you look through the clear part you're going to see that area and it'll have that green silvery kind of look uh, which you would see in real life. Once they're ma this back part's done then I actually paint the whole uh, periscope with the actual color it would be so that the, that's on the outside and you don't see this from the back side but only when you look through the lens portion. Kind of can see here 
kind of the effect. So the gun that sits on the roof is has the parts of it that are carbon fiber. Now I didn't realize at the time, but the big black decal in the model is actually a carbon fiber looking material. And so what you have to do is kind of cut it to fit and then mask it. Now it's a thick decal, but it did respond really well to the uh, decal softening products I used. Uh, I tried a couple different brands I have, and all of them had the same results. So I, I, I don't necessarily wouldn't have to recommend any. It, it seemed to respond to all of them nicely. Um, it's just a matter of getting it, fitting it, putting the masking softener on it, letting it cure for several hours, and then uh, maybe touching it up again um, to get the right effect. But uh, it did work out really well. Once this was all done, I took the entire model and I hit it with a clear. This gave it a kind of a hint of a shiny look, which the actual vehicle has. Normally I would hit it with a flat, but I wanted it to have that showroom look, so the clear was a much better choice. That sealed everything up, but also gave it that little shiny look, which, like I said, I was trying to accomplish. Now the Hero drone is a uh, white glossy drone. So I painted initially white and then uh, after I painted it, I hit it with a uh, clear coat of gloss. That would help the decal I had to install stick better, but also would give it the nice shiny look that the actual vehicle has. Now on the side of the drone it has a decal that says U-Vision. I was able to locate that online and then create a decal using a decal product. I hadn't done this before, uh, but it turned out really good. Uh, I was happy with the results. The one thing I didn't realize was printers don't print white. Because on the side of the gun there's a decal that says Rhine Metal. Well here you can see the decal. Well as soon as I cut the decal out, there was nothing on it. That's because, as I said, it's a white decal and printers don't print white. The other mistake I made is when you print these, you have to seal them with some kind of a sealer first. So I didn't seal it here and the decal basically melted. Um, so I had to start over. After successfully getting the decals installed and sealed, I went through and painted the lenses on the drones. And this, I used that smoke again. It's shiny. It's got the kind of the right effect as a camera lens. Um, I've, I've used it many times and I find it to be, for me, the right combination and effect. There's the drone has a camera. The drone I have coming out of the tube has a camera. And then the three that are still in the tubes all. So I had five of these to paint. On the side of the tank, it has the smoke launchers, which are orange on the showpiece. So I went through the process of painting them. It takes two coats because um, I used a thin paint, and then there's a little black tip on it I had to do. But uh, time-consuming, delicate work, but just a matter of patience and uh, a steady hand. Now, the one thing I wasn't real happy with is the tracks were just too um, pristine and uh, clean looking. Um, as someone pointed out to me, which I thought was the exact correct word, they were too sterile. So what I did is, because they were already installed on the vehicle, I masked everything off, the areas that would be exposed, and I took a enamel wash in black and hit the areas of the track that were exposed with that. Uh, making sure I got it real good and then I followed it up with some powder uh, in brown and then a, like a yellowish tan and hit those again to create the dusty look more realistic um, and then I finished that all off with a flat clear and I think this accomplished the correct look and didn't make it look so um, 
unrealistic looking. Um, the rest of the model itself on all the displays I've seen are is perfectly pristine so there was no real weathering to do there uh, but the tracks were just impossible to make them perfectly clean like that like it just drove out of the factory. So uh, I was able to accomplish that uh, successfully without messing the model up. So that's the build. Uh, a lot of time, I spent a lot more time painting it than I did building it because of the masking process and, and then just making it look good. Um, but I'm real happy with the results. Um, you can see the different details I did, uh, the different angles, things like that uh, going through. Um, as I did note that the uh, instructions masking uh, for the pattern I did is wrong. Um, so there was, you had to kind of do some comparisons to fix all that, uh, but it is very manageable. Uh, overall, very nice model, nice results. I'm very happy with it. Um, any questions, comments, always welcome. Please get me on Facebook. Please uh, like the video. Um, if you don't like it, let me know why. Don't just hit the dislike and don't say anything. That doesn't tell me anything. Um, but if it helps me become a better reviewer and better modeler. Uh, more videos coming out soon. Catch you on the next one, everybody. Take care and happy modeling. Bye-bye.